My immediate reaction was, whoa, like, what happened to you? Tonight on an all-new 2020, the verdict's in, the party's over. That explosive Vanderbilt assault trial just now finished. Are you Sir? trying to get an answer from somebody? Sir, could you please calm down? A victim so drunk she can't remember. I can't tell. Is that me? A crime that would have gone undetected, except for shocking surveillance tapes you'll only see here. That unconscious girl, carried from a car, dragged through a dorm, assaulted, the camera suddenly covered up. The first thing that went through my mind was, Lord, I hope she's a very, very, very strong person for what we're going to have to show to her. Tonight, the secret they thought they could hide inside dorm room 213. The whole story you haven't heard until now. Football players recording it, sharing it with buddies. He's like, hey man, get this on camera. The police interrogation tapes that crack the case. We just recovered the worst nightmare for these victims. And then panic as they try to destroy the evidence. Seems like it couldn't be more brazen of a cover-up. You delete this, you delete that. Will the way you think of your kids at school ever be the same? The party's over. They're gonna find all the videos, dude. Here now. David Muir and Elizabeth Vargas. Good evening, and right here tonight, you are about to hear and see exclusive new details in that explosive case making news as we're on the air tonight. A juror and what's being revealed just now. Could it affect the verdict? It's a case that would horrify any parent, and authorities say it could be playing out right now, any Friday night, any campus in America. But this is the story of what started in one hallway at Vanderbilt University. And you will see for the first time the surveillance tapes right here. It went far beyond that dorm hallway. College athletes taking a young woman, a cheerleader, into room 213. And what happened over the next 30 minutes would change young lives forever. The scene videotaped on cell phone. This story is stunning. And we're live tweeting and we'll host a chat at the end of the hour on Facebook. But first, what we have never heard until tonight. Here's Ryan Smith. Everyone, please remain seated. Come to order for the dinner session. This week, a very sour note in Music City, USA. Okay, let's bring the jury in. A swift verdict in a high-profile trial. All right, would you please stand and reach your verdict? That drove a stake right through the heart of the heartland. An explosive headline-making case. With those two former Vanderbilt University football players. And emotional testimony. Playing out in this courtroom for the past two weeks details of events on a summer night. One with an alcohol-fueled sex crime on a college campus, recorded instead of reported, as numerous bystanders encounter an incapacitated woman but do nothing to help her. About a half dozen individuals didn't intervene. You reported it to the head coach. I did not. You didn't report it to any soul on earth, did you? I did not. The combination of indifference by some and indecency by others is about to change lives on this campus forever. While Nashville is often called the capital of country music, it's earned one other moniker, the Athens of the South, because the city is home to at least 38 colleges and universities. And just a stone's throw from those honky-tonk bars and juke joints lies Vanderbilt University consistently ranked as one of the nation's top 20 schools. Tony Gonzalez is a reporter for the Tennessean, Nashville's paper of record. So when this story came across your desk, what was your reaction? Well, I don't think we'd seen a, a case quite like this here in Nashville, um, just with the, the level of the institution, the serious nature of these charges. From the beginning, you knew that lives were probably going to be changed. It begins on a balmy night in June. Brandon Vandenberg, the nation's number one junior college tight end, is drinking with the victim at a popular bar, the Tin Roof. She's 21, he's 20, and the prize athlete of Vanderbilt's recruiting class. Um, he'd actually only been on campus a couple of weeks. Brandon Vandenberg was a star. Yes, Brandon had it all. Fletcher Long is Brandon's attorney. He probably would have started the very first game, day one, on Vanderbilt's football team. When did they first meet? On his recruiting visit, uh, which I don't think they had known each other more than a couple of weeks when the event occurred. The female, who works for the athletic department and is a member of the Vanderbilt Dance Spirit Team, meets the six foot six All-American from Palm Desert, California on a recruiting trip to Vanderbilt and shows him around campus. And now that he's there, Brandon and the young neuroscience student are having nights like this one. Both had been drinking earlier with friends before meeting up. At the bar, 
the booze is flowing. The victim recalls a cinnamon whiskey shot, a gin and tonic, and a California Long Island iced tea. People have been drinking on college campuses for decades. These are young adults. They leave the bar together in the early morning hours and share a cab to her place. But her house key doesn't work. So the football star comes up with a plan B. Brandon and she go to Gillette Hall in her car. Brandon's driving. And the evening of casual fun moves to a new venue, his dorm. By the next morning, a sore body and a serious hangover are the only evidence of a night of excess. She woke up, she didn't know what happened. And that's where the story might have ended, were it not for this broken door. It is an unrelated act of vandalism that occurred over the weekend. When a maintenance worker alerts campus cops about it on Monday, they go to the surveillance video looking for a culprit. What they find instead is a Vanderbilt video like no other. They were reviewing hours and hours when they found, obviously, some alarming footage. So whoever broke that door broke this case open. In this exclusive security surveillance video, obtained only by 2020, we see Brandon and his inebriated date pulling up to the dorm. When the car pulled up outside of the dorm and the young woman was unconscious, essentially Brandon Vandenberg asked for help to move her into the dorm. June 23rd, 2.32 a.m. While a police cruiser sits off in the near distance, the 20-year-old football player carries the young woman out of her black Mercedes Benz and into Gillette dorm. ABC News is blurring the image to protect the victim. Brandon and his three Commodore compatriots laughing and smiling. These were all members of the football team at that time. They all knew each other at least a little bit. What's your interpretation of what he's doing at that point? There's no indication that there was any nefarious intent to get her to the room. There are students all over Gillette Circle. They're seeing him walk into the front lobby of Gillette. Nobody says boo. In many ways for you, it's not uncommon that these four young men would carry her upstairs and no one would say a thing. It didn't appear uncommon to any resident of Gillette Hall. Then at 2.35 a.m., the woman is dragged out of the elevator and dumped onto the hallway floor. Cell phone pictures are taken of her as she lays on the ground. One student moves in for a close-up. She is then moved down the hall and into room 213. It looked like they were carrying a dead body down the hall. The surveillance footage shows that in those the next half hour or so, um, the young woman ended up back out in the hallway. She was moved. She was dropped. Shortly after 3 a.m., the victim has been inside room 213 for nearly a half an hour with four men and a fifth who claims to have been sleeping. Brandon, now wearing red shorts, walks out with a towel on his head and in a damning move, throws it over a surveillance camera. Later, all the players involved exit the room and in fact, some exit the floor entirely, leaving Brandon to figure out what to do next. He makes a phone call to other teammates and they run to his rescue. They were in complete cover-up mode. He came to Vanderbilt University and was made it about two weeks before he got into an ordeal of a lifetime. An ordeal, the defense says, that could have been prevented. Campus cops are in the area, but they are investigating another matter. They have 1,200 cameras all over the campus with apparently no one watching on the other end. What happened when they saw this footage? What did authorities do next? As I understand it, um, an investigation began immediately on campus. That involved athletic staff, it involved the deans and other campus staff, and very quickly, the city police got involved. That's the where detectives University Chad Gish and Jason Mayo of Nashville Police come in. At the time, uh, she knew absolutely nothing. She knew she had gone out with friends the night before, and that's it. Typically, in a case where the victim doesn't remember an alleged sexual assault, you're gonna have a really tough time getting a conviction. Detectives know something went on in room 213. They just don't know what and they have yet to determine if Brandon Vandenberg was the victim's protector or predator. In her heart at that time, she truly believed that Brandon Vandenberg would never let anything happen to her. Obviously, you know why you're here today, okay? When we return, inside the interrogation room, a battle for the truth. Then, a second video surfaces, and even grizzled detectives are stunned. It was atrocious. I tried my best to describe the images. But there's no words for it. 
Stay with us. Twenty twenty continues once again. Ryan Smith. Well, the race is all in here. Nashville, Tennessee. The Third Coast, as it's often called, home to some of the country's biggest stars and best colleges. But there's evidence of misconduct in the music city. Vanderbilt University campus police have stumbled upon suspicious surveillance video, video never seen publicly before tonight. A young woman, helpless and half clothed, in the clutches of football players being dragged unconscious through a dorm hallway after a night of hard drinking. But what actually happened? Typical college hijinks or a crime? Campus police go to the pros. Digital forensics investigator Chad Gish and sex crimes detective Jason Mayo of the Metro Nashville Police. Their alarm bells go off immediately. I didn't know what happened, but I thought something did happen. It didn't take a whole lot of investigation skills to understand what we thought we had on our hands at that point. And what did you think you had? A sexual assault. Mayo parades a who's who of Vanderbilt students in for questioning, beginning with the 21-year-old woman in the video. The honor student has no memory of what happened after fireball shots and mixed drinks at the Tin Roof Bar, and no recall of any assault. How often do you have a case where you're called about a victim and not the victim coming to you about a possible sexual assault? I have never investigated an adult case where the victim didn't already at least suspect something. In their first meeting with the victim, Detective Mayo shows her screen grabs from the surveillance video. In addition to blurring the video, 2020 is altering the young woman's voice. I can't tell. Is that me? Yeah, that is you. You're being carried in. How much do you think you had to drink that night? I don't remember. So you don't remember anything once you left the tin roof? Right. Until you woke up the next morning? Right. Now, when you woke up the next morning, you had no... There was no pain. I didn't have any pain. Nothing to make you think that anything took place during the night? I felt really hungover, but I wasn't in any pain that would make me think I'd been assaulted. But detectives still suspect foul play. Next step, identifying the four Vanderbilt football players seen in the video. At the center of the storm, new recruit Brandon Vandenberg. He's been in a relationship with her. They were drinking together at the tin roof that night. With him are his teammates, 19-year-old Brandon Banks, 19-year-old Nashville native Corey Beatty, and 18-year-old sophomore Jaborian Tip McKenzie. All four seen entering dorm room 213 with the woman, staying inside for 30 minutes. Two days after the alleged incident, all four meet again at a restaurant. Detectives think it's so they can get their story straight. Brandon Banks is called up, but he's not biting. What was your involvement inside the room? I touched that dude. I've been moving it. Who did touch her? I don't know. So you were in the room, we didn't see anything? I didn't see anything. I, I get what you're doing, sticking to the store and not wanting to sell out your teammate or snitch. If that's the story you want to stick with, okay. Roll those dice, buddy, because I'm telling you, it'll end up bad for you. Mayo also questions other players who were not in the room, but seen in the hallways at the dorm that night. They tell consistent accounts of seeing the unconscious co-ed. What condition was she in when you saw her? She was passed out. Basically, like her shirt was, so it was kind of pulled scrunched up. Yes, sir, like up here. Okay. She, she was naked. She, she looked like she was dead. Face down. It looked like she had been slapped on the butt. But Mayo zeroes in on the conversations the kids had with Brandon Vandenberg that night. Conversations that for star wide receiver and team leader Chris Boyd sounded incriminating. His story kept changing and he just kept just talking and like he's going 100 miles per hour. I think he was just kind of in shock, didn't really know what to do. But Commodore's quarterback Austin Carter Samuels tells police Brandon Vandenberg claimed he was blameless. Did anything ever come up about that he was involved in any kind of sexual activity with her? No, he claimed that he didn't over and over again. Did he ever claim who did have no. sexual contact with her? He just alluded to other guys. He just said other guys. Okay. 
Austin says he also spoke to Tip McKenzie. He told me that he was extremely scared just because he said that he had had no part in anything that was going on in the room. And so he just wanted to tell me like that he hadn't <coughs> done anything. Football pal Dylan Vanderwall says Vandenberg pointed the finger at Corey Beatty. Okay, so Brandon Vandenberg is telling you yeah. that he tried to have sex with her but was not able to. Yeah. He wasn't able to have sex with her because uh, he was so drunk. Within hours of the alleged incident, sheepish whispers turned to rampant rumors spreading throughout the locker room. There was a bunch of different like stuff flying around the team saying like they did this to her, they did that to her. It was just the most like disturbing things I've ever heard. Jake Bernstein, a football player and the victim's ex-boyfriend, is appalled. Uh, that's when I told her I was like something might have happened to you this weekend that you may have not recollected. But during her interview with police, the victim seems to be giving Brandon the benefit of the doubt. My feeling is that Brandon didn't do anything. I'm really concerned that, I think he was just trying to help me and I feel like he's getting in trouble for trying to help me. Why is he in trouble? Because like, I didn't want to, be, I don't think he should have like, left me laying out you know, in the street or something. And she goes even further, telling police that the day after the alleged incident, the couple had consensual sex. I've been like seeing him, like he's one of my, like I trust him. She didn't believe at that point she had been raped. No, she's, her, in her heart at that time, she truly believed that Brandon Vandenberg would never let anything happen to her. Police suggest a rape kit, even though it's past the recommended 72 hour limit. She reluctantly agrees. Would you be willing to go around to the emergency room and have a medical legal exam? I mean, would that tell me if something happened or not? It could or it couldn't. The kit would provide no proof of an assault, but something else soon would. It turns out there are yet more videos discovered by the two detectives, but these were recorded inside room 213, and they will be the smoking guns in this case. When we come back, a treasure trove of digital evidence and an incriminating Google search can police retrieve deleted picture messages? Turns out they can. Hey, they're gonna find all the videos, dude. Stay with us. Twenty twenty continues with the party's over. Once more, Ryan Smith. Nashville police have a problem. The Vanderbilt senior they believe is a victim of a crime has no memory of what happened to her. Surveillance video and interviews have led detectives to suspect rape, but they have no physical proof, no DNA, and no suspects coming forward with a confession. So what exactly happened inside dorm room 213? Four football players, Brandon Vandenberg, Corey Beatty, Tip McKenzie, and Brandon Banks were alone with the woman for 30 minutes. When you spoke to these four men, did they say a rape had happened? No. So they said they were there, but nothing happened? Right. They truly thought at that time, they'll never figure this out. As long as we keep together, keep our mouths shut, they'll never figure this out. But a breakthrough is imminent, thanks to an admission by a couple of other players on the team. They've seen video from a cell phone of what took place inside that room. What did you see in the video? I noticed somebody laying there. It looked like a girl was laying on the ground. Finding the videos, now the key to the case. We knew the videos were taken. We knew many videos were taken. And the investigation shifted at that point to let's put all of our effort right now into recovering the videos. Police seize the phones and computers from the four men in the room. And it reveals a treasure trove of text messages, like this one from Corey Beatty to a friend a day and a half after the incident. The video is gone, right? And nobody else knows besides you? And this one, video deleted? Seems like it couldn't be more brazen of a cover-up. You delete this, you delete that? Completely. And Gish finds incriminating Google searches on Brandon Vandenberg's phone. Can police retrieve deleted picture messages? Brandon has reason to worry. He knows that during the attack, he sent videos to two close friends back in his hometown of Palm Desert, California. Four weeks after the incident, the detectives are on a plane. First stop, Joey Quinzio, 
one of Brandon's best friends since age 13. He couldn't believe that we were there, but he knew why we were there. He knew immediately. He knew. Brandon sent you some text messages and a video. Did you watch the video that he sent to you? I did. You didn't? No. Okay. But friend Miles Finley reluctantly admits he's seen it. Phones don't lie, man. That's why we're here. The video I got was just of this black dude playing with a girl on the floor. Playing with a girl on the floor, how? What were they playing? Uh, doing stuff between her legs. After seeing the video, Finley warns Brandon in a text. She can call rape, delete that expletive, then some repulsive advice. Dog, kick that expletive out or gangbang her. Don't let her wake up. Why did you say that? I wasn't being serious. When you see something going on like that and it's a rape, maybe you should have called the police. Did that ever occur to you? Maybe I should tell somebody about what I just see. Well, I knew it would come out. Sounds like Brandon does too. Just 30 minutes after the incident, he phones that friend Joey Quinzio and says, I mean, you gotta call me that. Police say that what Brandon and his friends did next was an attempted cover-up. Finley claims he dropped his phone in a pool. It was cracked and, you know, it's time for a new iPhone. So did you trade it in? You tossed it in the trash? And you I threw it out. Quinzio claims his phone was stolen. Okay, did you report your phone stolen to Apple so they could shut it down? No. But it didn't matter. Police find those elusive videos after all, backed up on Quinzio's hard drive. His phone automatically synced the video to his computer. It's the nail in the coffin. Hardest thing I probably ever had to look at. And um, I knew right then that all of the pieces were falling into place. There she is, being raped. We just recovered the worst nightmare for this victim. The videos show Brandon Banks taking intimate and inappropriate photos of her body. And Banks and Corey Beatty using their hands and even a water bottle to penetrate her. And according to investigators, Brandon Vandenberg is heard callously giggling and egging the others on. All along, the four players have stuck to their plan. Deny, deny, deny. But what they don't know, players are turning on each other. Brandon Vandenberg agreed to call Corey Beatty with police recording the line and attempt to get Beatty to confess. This is bad, dude. What the heck? Dude, we're that they got like videos of everything, like the videos that I took of you in the like when I was in the room, you know? Yeah. I'm pretty sure the video I took, like, it didn't have you, it didn't have you, like, having sex with her or nothing, but, you know, I had, like, either you or, uh, Banks, like, her. I don't know how much trouble you can get in for that. Beatty keeps quiet in that call, but another player has broken rank. Tip McKenzie has caved, and he's pointing his finger at his best friends, Corey Beatty and Brandon Banks. Corey Beatty. Approaches the girl first. So as a uh, as a joke, he's really clown. He's drunk. He's like, hey man, get this on camera. He's messing with the girl. His hands down there like he's touching her in you know in a sexual way. What was Banks? The Banks just had the bottle. If I'm understanding right, the only people who did anything to her, either with a bottle or their hands. Arbadian Banks. Yes, ma'am. Did Vandenberg ever touch her, participate in the clown, touching her or anything like that? I really don't think so. I'm not, I'm not sure, but as I can remember, I don't think he did. That interview and the videos, it's more than enough for prosecutors to make a case. Once we saw the evidence, we were just appalled. Vanderbilt has already kicked the four players off the football team and out of school. And August 9th, less than two months after the incident, they are charged with rape. Today marked day one of the trial. Next, the trial. Contentious moments in court. Don't look over there. I'm asking you a question. A controversial defense. Blame it on the booze. Blame it on the alcohol, correct? Oh, uh, that question. That's, that's what... And one of the defendants takes the stand and makes a shocking admission. Uh, uh. So, as you just saw in those police interrogation tapes, the rumors are flying. Several people have actually seen the tape of the crime taking place. Are you surprised they stayed silent? Tell us on Twitter. Use the hashtag ABC2020. And when we come back here tonight, the victim and one of the defendants taking the stand. Elizabeth and I will be right back.
we return to 2020 and the party's over. Once again, Ryan Smith. On the lush green campus of Vanderbilt University, the unspeakable happened to a 21-year-old co-ed. It breaks the heart of a veteran detective to have to show her that horrific video of the assault. She was just so sure that Brandon Vandenberg would never let anything happen to her. And then when I told her what happened, it, it, it's like it crushed her. Later, judgment day has finally arrived for Corey Beatty and Brandon Vandenberg. The pair on trial for aggravated rape inside a dorm room. Co-defendants Tip McKenzie and Brandon Banks set to be tried at a later date. Little did she know that day that had a, such great promise for her would turn into her worst nightmare. Nightmare she lived with for a long time. And they almost got away. They almost succeeded. Not only did they violate laws of the state, the very principles of human decency. But in court, indecency and intoxication would take center stage. How often did you do these pregame parties before you went out and hit the bars? This is something that everyone partakes in probably every time before they go out. As Vanderbilt student after student took the stand to testify. Right. At any time did you attempt to speak to her? No, sir. Or at any time did you check on her welfare? No, sir. No one alerted anyone. Not even the victim's roommate, Lauren Miller, who noticed something odd the morning after the incident. So when you came outside, your best friend's shoe is on the lawn and her car is gone. Correct. And so you called the police. I did not call the police. I didn't report it because I didn't have a concern at the time. But once Lauren saw her later that day, red flags went up. When I first saw her, it was... My immediate reaction was, whoa, like, what happened to you? So she even took a photo of, of what looked like injuries on her friend's buttocks. You can clearly see some bruising on the butt cheek as well with some red handprint, well, what appears to be some sort of imprint on her butt. This was also part of my Exhibit 2C. The After days of listening to others talk about her, the victim herself testifies. 2020 is altering her voice. I never felt like that in my life. For 90 minutes, she keeps the courtroom riveted with details of a hazy night at the tin roof and an evening that comes to a halt after sipping a blue beverage. Did you finish the blue drink? I don't remember finishing it. What's the next thing that you remember? I remember waking up in an unfamiliar room at 8 something the next morning. In a fog, she texts Brandon Vandenberg to fill in the blanks. In Brandon's version, he's a knight in shining armor. What did he tell you? I had gotten sick in his room and he had to spend the whole night taking care of me and that it was horrible. I apologized, I was embarrassed. Brandon continued to lay on the guilt trip in texts. On the stand, she read some of those messages. I didn't do anything and I feel like I'm getting blamed for stuff that didn't even happen. I just wanna cry. Me and a bunch of my teammates are probably going to get kicked off the team unless something changes. And what was your main concern at that time? My main concern was protecting Mr. Vandenberg. The pair meet up later that day. How is he treating you? He is being extremely kind, nicer than usual. What happened next? He kissed me, then um, he initiated intercourse. And how long did that last? A few seconds. What the victim is never told by Brandon is that he and three others were involved in her sexual assault and videotaped the encounter to share with friends. Two months later, the victim will learn exactly how and who inflicted that pain when she watches the videos. Were you able to identify yourself? That was me. The video you did view, did it have audio also? It did. Did you hear a voice? I heard a voice I recognized. And whose voice did you hear on the video? Brandon Vandenberg. The horrific laughing with Brandon Vandenberg and just the awful degrading tone that they were using. Brandon's not laughing anymore. He's watching stoically as his childhood best friends from California testify against him about trying to cover up the cell phone video. Joey Quinzio saying he was pressured by Brandon to lie to police. I believe I was being coerced. By who? Mr. Vandenberg and his attorney. And Miles Finley saying Brandon destroyed evidence. 
Did he tell you what happened to your cell phone? Yes. What did he say happened? He said he smashed it and threw it in the lake. During cross-examination, Brandon's defense attorney seized on some of Miles' text messages during the assault. Dog kicked that expletive out or gangbanger. Don't let her wake up. You were giving him direction on that night, telling him what to do, weren't you, Mr. Findlay? Don't look at him. Uh, look up here at me. Why, why are you looking over there? I'm over here. Who are you looking at? Are sir, you trying to get an answer from somebody sir, over here? Sir, could you please yeah. calm down because I'm not, I'm not yelling at you. Eventually, he does okay. calm down and well, attempts to make a distinction that. that his client did not penetrate the victim sexually and therefore should not be charged with rape. He is taking responsibility for what he did. He shouldn't have taken those photographs. He shouldn't have sent those photographs. That is what he did. What he shouldn't have to take responsibility for is what he didn't do. But for Corey Beatty, the defense is tougher. Remember, he was seen on video touching the victim. So his legal team throws a Hail Mary and calls Corey himself to testify something defendants rarely do. Corey, who grew up in a rough part of Nashville and whose mom works at Vanderbilt, appears nervous, but is sure to make eye contact with jurors. At times, his memory is razor sharp, but ask him how photos of the victim got on his phone, his mind goes blank. I didn't know how they got there. I didn't remember it, and uh, I, I, hadn't, I didn't know what had happened uh, to the young lady in, in the pictures, and I, I immediately deleted them. Corey estimates he had between 14 and 22 alcoholic drinks that night and claims he still can't remember what happened on the night in question. What, if any, recollection today do you have of that event? Not at all. But then, a stunning admission by the 20-year-old defendant, one that is likely to send him to prison. I was just drunk, drunk out of my mind. Uh, this is something I would... Uh, never do in my, my right state of mind. Uh, um, I'm just sorry. Do you take responsibility for your conduct? After seeing the footage, I, I do. Uh, it was me. And then he tries to speak directly to the victim. I would just like to extend a personal apology to Miss. Would that apology sway the jury's decision? When 2020 returns, the verdict is in. Uh, we, the jury, find the defendant, Corey Lamont Beatty. And the jury speaks out. But a revelation just hours ago could change everything. When we return. Twenty twenty continues with the party's over. Here again, Ryan Smith. After 12 days and 25 witnesses, prosecutors and attorneys for the two football players accused of raping a fellow Vanderbilt student, making their final pitches to the jury. You heard testimony from many witnesses, but you also have physical evidence. You have photographs. The most uncontrovertible evidence against the defendants, photos and video of the assault, taken by the one prosecutors characterized as the mastermind. Brandon Vandenberg. He is laughing hysterically. You see him pull his phone out of his pocket because he's going to take a video of this. This is so funny. But Brandon isn't laughing in court. He sits stone-faced as prosecutors present the laundry list of charges against him. Five counts of aggravated rape, unlawful penetration, aggravated sexual battery, tampering with evidence. Co-defendant Corey Beatty's attorney suggests an anything-goes party culture at the campus was the real culprit. What was the culture for Corey Beatty? Culture encouraged underage drinking. Consume alcohol to the point where you pass out or can't remember. Brandon Vandenberg's attorney takes a different approach, claiming his client was a virtual bystander and only filmed his teammates assaulting the victim. I think Mr. Vandenberg's biggest defense is that is not I and I should not be held accountable for the actions of others. Honestly. He maintains Vandenberg's only crime was taking pictures. He took photographs that he never should have taken. He exercised judgment that was deplorable. He at least had the sense in the aftermath to be upset by it. After three 
hours of deliberation, the jury decides the fate of the two young men. In regards to Mr. Vandenberg, um, count one, we find Mr. Vandenberg guilty of aggravated rape. An outcry from Brandon Vandenberg's father. His son's promising football career lost, along with his freedom. Corey Beatty, on this, his 21st birthday, hangs his head as the jury foreman reads. Guilty of aggravated rape. Guilty of attempted aggravated rape. Guilty of aggravated sexual battery. Guilty on all charges. Both men face decades in prison. They will be sentenced in early March. I quickly realized that in such a short period of time, so many young lives were utterly devastated. We spoke to three jurors the day after the verdicts. I asked them about that cell phone video. You all have seen something that I have not seen, and that is that video. Tell me what your feelings were when they played that video for you. Horrified. Horrified and utterly disgusted. Of, of course, there's an emotional reaction the first, the first time you see it. It sort of blows your mind how, how graphic and depraved it is. I asked myself, how could they do this to this young lady? I mean, she is lifeless. It, there just can't be enough explanation for me. The chapter is not closed on some of the other players involved in that fateful night. Two of the other football players in dorm room 213 that night, Jaborian McKenzie and Brandon Banks, have been charged for the assault. Their trial date has not yet been determined. Brandon Vandenberg's childhood friends in California, who he sent the videos to, were charged with tampering with evidence after he implored them to get rid of their cell phones. Last week, Joey Quinzio pleaded guilty to a lesser misdemeanor. Miles Finley was offered the same plea agreement, but has so far declined it. And another Vanderbilt football player, Chris Boyd, pled guilty to a misdemeanor for helping carry the unconscious victim into Brandon's dorm room. I'm curious to know the people that we saw in the surveillance video that saw that victim totally unconscious being carried down the hall to that room, the multiple people that saw her, where are they thinking now? We are civilized human beings and the rules and responsibilities of living in a society that you look out for your fellow man. The chancellor of Vanderbilt released this statement yesterday that reads in part, I am deeply troubled that some students who knew or should have known about the incident that led to this week's convictions failed to take any positive action. This is not the culture at Vanderbilt, and it must never be repeated. But the jury's decision may not be the final word. In a stunning turn of events earlier today, Brandon Vandenberg's defense attorneys told ABC News they plan to file a motion to vacate the verdicts. 2020 has learned that one of the jurors failed to disclose during jury selection that they had been a victim of statutory rape. To not disclose that you were the victim of a sex crime in a case where it's about a sex crime is not a frivolous motion on the part of the defense. In a statement to ABC News, an attorney for the jurors said, the past situation has zero similarity to the facts presented within the Vanderbilt trial, nor did the past situation have any impact upon deliberations or decision-making in this case. And for the detectives who cracked the case, the verdict carries a profound message to victims of sexual crimes. Do you think that'll help other sexual assault victims come forward and say, they heard her, maybe they'll hear me. I hope that the public and other victims see this as, okay, I can tell my story, people will believe me. The victim in this case is not revealing her identity, but released a statement thanking police and prosecutors for bringing her attackers to justice. You are my heroes and I am so proud of and grateful for each of you. Yesterday in her statement, she called you guys heroes. Mm -mm. I know you're shaking your head, but I want to ask you, what would you say to her right now? I'll tell you what I told her. I'm not your hero. You are my hero. Exactly. It's simple as that. Three lives converged that night on June of 2013. Brandon Vandenberg, the football recruit from Palm Desert, California, hoping to break into pro sports. Corey Beatty, the accomplished Tennessee native, 
and the pride of his family, and the bright, beautiful neuroscience major who was their victim. All of them forever changed in a single night. Incredible, so many young lives changed forever, and we know you'll want to weigh in at home with your thoughts, so share them with Ryan Smith and our team of experts. They'll be live chatting on 2020's Facebook page immediately after tonight's program. And David and I will be right back. That's our program for tonight, but tune in tomorrow night for a special edition of 2020 Saturday at 10 p.m. Eastern. I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Muir. We'll see you tomorrow night. In the meantime, from all of us here at 2020, have a great weekend. Good night.